Hello, and welcome to today's Full Plate Living Workshop. We are very excited to have two expert guests with us today for our Integrative Medicine and the Anti-Inflammatory Diet Talk, uh, Dr. Andrew Weil and Diana Weil. So welcome, so glad to have you both with us today. Um, before I hand this off to them though, I do want to go over a few housekeeping things with you. This is technology. It is great when it works perfect, but sometimes it doesn't. So one of the first things I want you to do is find the chat, say hello, tell us where you're joining us from. And then also, um, if we have found that the Chrome browser works best for this service. So um, if you have issues with connection, that's one thing you can always try. If you can't hear us or see us, one of the things you can do is just refresh your screen, refresh your connection. Um, but if you have issues with any of that, you can also ask us in the chat and we can give you some more um, helpful advice there. I see people joining us from all over Phoenix, Arizona, which I know y'all to know very well there, Virginia, Cincinnati, Oklahoma, where I'm at. So people from all over. And so we are so excited to have you all with us today. The chat section is also where you're going to ask questions today. We will have time at the end for some Q&A time for whatever time allows. We'll try to get in as many as we can, um, but be very mindful of everyone's time today. So with that, I'm going to give a little bio and I'm going to read this because it is amazing what both of these individuals have done. So Dr. Uh, Weil is a world renowned leader and pioneer in the field of integrative medicine, combining a Harvard education and a lifetime of practicing natural and preventative medicine. He is the founder and director of the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona, where he is a clinical professor of medicine and professor of public health. A New York Times bestselling author, uh, Dr. Weil is author of 15 books on health and well-being, including Mind Over Meds, Know Your Drugs Are Necessary, Know When Your Drugs Are Necessary, When Alternatives Are Better, and When to Let Your Body Heal on Its Own, Fast Food, Good Food, True Food, Sensational, Sustainable, Simple, Pure, and uh, Spontaneous Happiness, Healthy Aging, and Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, so and a number more than even what I've mentioned there. He is the editorial, editorial director for drwild.com, which I still would invite you all to join. I have really enjoyed receiving um, the information that they email out there. Um, he leads the online resources for healthy living based on the philosophy of integrative medicine. He is also a founder and partner of the growing family of true food kitchen restaurants. So be sure to uh, Google the nearest one to you and put that on your list to go and visit. Now, Diana Weil, um, is his daughter, and she specializes in integrative and holistic nutrition. She has a Master of Science in Nutrition and Integrative Health with a focus on clinical nutrition from Maryland University of Integrative Health. She's a certified integrative and holistic health coach from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, as well as a certified yoga instructor. I love that. I love yoga. So fabulous. We are so very honored to have both of you here today. I am going to pop off and I'm going to hand it over to you. So thank you both so, so very much for being with us today and cannot wait to uh, hear everything you have to share with us today. Thank you, we're very happy to be here. And uh, I thought I would begin by saying a few words about integrative medicine, uh, which is the field that I work in. Integrative medicine is I think the way of the future. <clears throat> it's the intelligent combination of conventional medicine with natural remedies and an emphasis on prevention. And prevention especially includes lifestyle medicine, one of the important components of, of integrative medicine. And that means looking at how lifestyle choices influence health and risks of disease and how to encourage people to make better rather than worse lifestyle choices. And a major part of that is dietary choices. <clears throat> I've worked hard over the past maybe 30, 40 years to help create a field of nutritional medicine. As I'm sure many of you know, nutrition is very underemphasized in medical training. <clears throat> Most physicians have never had good education in nutrition. That continues to this day. Um, and it's hard for them to remedy that, <clears throat> excuse me, that defect in their education. Nutritional medicine, there are two aspects of it <clears throat> that interest me. One is to think about what is an optimum diet? You know, given that people are different, we have different biochemistry, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural preferences, what generalizations can you make 
about how to eat in order to attain best health, maximum longevity, and lowest risk of disease. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that the standard American diet, which is sometimes abbreviated the SAD diet, is not supportive of health and longevity. It gives us the wrong kinds of fats, the wrong kinds of carbohydrates, and not enough of the protective elements that are mostly found in fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, beverages. There's been a lot of research on different types of diets around the world, and the one for which we have the greatest scientific data is the Mediterranean diet, a composite of eating patterns found in countries like Greece, Italy, Spain, parts of North Africa, and the Middle East. When we talk about a Mediterranean diet or other traditional diets, <clears throat> it's important to remember that not many people may be eating them anymore, except in relatively remote areas, because we have been very successful at exporting our worst eating habits all over the world, especially American fast food, which has become popular everywhere. But the Mediterranean diet emphasizes fruits and vegetables. It's relatively low in, in animal products, especially meat, but includes some high quality dairy products, whole grains, a low in refined carbohydrates, low in sugar, uses olive oil as a main fat, um, and, uh, you know, there's a great deal of evidence, scientific evidence, that this is a very healthy eating pattern and one that's acceptable to most people. Uh, my daughter, Diana, and I are very much in agreement that food should provide pleasure. Uh, and taking pleasure away from eating is not a way to, to move. And a problem I've had throughout my lifetime is that when I try to talk to people about eating healthy, most people think that means giving up everything you like. And that is absolutely not true. Many people have never had the experience of eating very delicious food that's also good for you. But it's very possible to do that. And Diana will give you some tips you know, for how to incorporate that in your life. Now, some time ago, and I think it's probably 20 years ago, I began to notice in the scientific literature a growing hypothesis that chronic low-level inflammation is the root cause of many serious diseases. We all know inflammation on the surface of the body. It's local redness, heat, swelling, and pain at an area that's injured or under attack. You know, inflammation is uncomfortable, but it is actually the cornerstone of the body's healing response. It's the way that the body gets more nourishment and more immune activity to an area that needs it. But inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it stay where it's supposed to stay and end when it's supposed to end. If inflammation persists, if it serves no purpose, if it escapes its boundaries of time and space, it becomes productive of disease. And there is growing realization that many of the most serious diseases that kill and disable people prematurely are rooted in chronic low-level inappropriate inflammation. And this is a, a very different way of thinking because when I was in medical school, I was taught that diseases like uh, coronary artery disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, were completely separate disease entities that had nothing in common. And now we're seeing that there is a common thread here. So coronary artery disease begins as inflammation in the lining of arteries. Alzheimer's disease begins as inflammation in the brain. And cancer is connected here because anything that increases inflammation in the body also causes cells to divide more frequently. You can't separate those two things. So anything that is pro-inflammatory is also pro-proliferative. And whenever cells proliferate, the risk of malignant transformation is increased. So the good news here is that all of these, if all of these diseases have a common root, then there is a common strategy for dealing with them. And that is doing whatever you can to reduce inappropriate inflammation. Your inflammatory status has a number of influences. There are genetic influences, environmental influences, for example, secondhand tobacco smoke is a very powerful pro-inflammatory agent. But diet has a major role, and that's one that potentially we have total control over. So I looked at ways of giving people suggestions for how to eat to reduce inappropriate inflammation. I used the Mediterranean diet as a template because we have so much evidence for its benefits. I tweaked it by adding Asian influences to it things like green tea and turmeric and mushrooms, all of which I'm familiar with from time that I've spent in Japan and China and other parts of Asia. 
So that's the anti-inflammatory diet. You can find the details of it on my website. I have an anti-inflammatory diet pyramid. And the first step of the anti-inflammatory diet is to stop eating refined, processed, and manufactured food. That's really what is doing us in. I'm going to let my daughter talk about it. One of the things that I love um, about what my dad said was that food should be pleasurable. And I think it's really important that we um, understand that the anti-inflammatory diet should be an enjoyable process, that this isn't something, you know, that you're eating bland grains with, you know, disgusting vegetables. Like this is an enjoyable diet. And I love the premise that you know, we're removing foods that are, aren't benefiting us, but that we're adding in lots of delicious foods, you know, like spices and spices and whole grains and vegetables that do taste delicious. But the hard part is how do we take ourselves from a highly processed diet um, and switching it over to an anti-inflammatory diet? And that's something that I really focus on is creating small habit changes through diet and you know, our lifestyle, but that are applicable and easy. Um, can you guys hear me? Are we still having static issues? Are we good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amy, are we okay? We're good. Okay. Um, this is the, you know, this is the good stuff. We've got to get to the important habits. <laughs> so what I like to look at are, you know, creating small habit changes. For example, if one of the issues, one of the reasons that I see people choosing these inflammatory foods is because they are busy, they don't have time for themselves, um, life is very chaotic. But I wanna really emphasize that choosing an anti-inflammatory diet doesn't need to be you know, spending eight hours in the kitchen on a Sunday. It can be choosing farro or barley instead of white rice. It can be choosing to add two vegetables to dinner and two vegetables to lunch instead of no vegetables at lunch and dinner. It can be choosing to switch from butter, which is okay. You know, you can still have some butter. We're not saying you can't have any butter, but it can be choosing olive oil instead of butter. You know, these aren't things that you need to spend eight hours in the kitchen doing. These are easy swaps to make. Um, and then one thing I really want to emphasize as well is that this is lifestyle, you know, so if you are really stressed and overwhelmed and that's impacting your eating down the line, that maybe what we do is we start with some breathing exercises in the morning so that you have the capacity and the mental space to then focus on a healthy breakfast. I'm sure, I, I hope that my dad uh, shares the four, seven, eight breath because I think that that's a very important part of, you know, the anti-inflammatory diet, even though it's just, you know, you might think that it's only breath. How does that impact diet? But I think one of the parts about integrative medicine and integrative health is that you can't just separate the food that you're eating from everything else that's going on in your life. And I think breath is such an important part of being able to make healthier choices throughout your days. Um, so one thing I really just want to emphasize is that this isn't, you know, we're not saying that you can't have delicious foods. In fact, I find that the anti-inflammatory diet is the best way of eating. It's the most delicious way of eating because you get, you know, fantastic fruits and vegetables. You get an array of of colors, an array of spices, different grains. And one thing that's really fun about this is that you get to explore different foods that maybe you've never tried before, different grains, different ways of preparing things. Um, you know, one of our favorite meals, we eat pasta. We like pasta, but one of the things that I love what my dad says is that the way you cook pasta is important. So instead of overcooking pasta, make it so that it's an al dente, al dente pasta, and then add in a lot of vegetables, add in olive oil, and then all of a sudden you're taking something that's a very inflammatory meal and turning it into more of an anti-inflammatory diet appropriate meal. So again, these are small habit changes that don't have to be too complicated, that don't have to taste bad, that you can enjoy, that are really gonna benefit the way that you feel, the way that you live. Um, Dad, do you wanna share that? What do you think about sharing the 478 breath? Well, I'll do that in a minute, but first, okay. I'm say <laughs> I'm not, several researchers have advocated what they call a green Mediterranean diet. And this is uh, taking the Mediterranean diet, but further reducing animal foods in it, eat, increasing fruits and vegetables, and especially increasing the intake of a class of compounds called polyphenols. Uh, this is a large class of compounds found in plants 
especially in fruits, vegetables, particularly berries, uh, in green tea, in spices, uh, in, in chocolate also. And you might be happy to hear that my anti-inflammatory diet pyramid has dark chocolate at the very top. You know, I consider that a healthy food and it has anti-inflammatory effect. So again, we're not taking pleasure away. I would advise you to, to learn about which fats are good and which fats are not. Uh, and olive oil by far is the, uh, the, a very good choice because it has a unique anti-inflammatory compound in it. Um, I also use avocado oil in my cooking, uh, but I stay away from polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which are pro-inflammatory. You don't want to eat margarine or hardened vegetable shortening. And also learn about the differences between carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not bad, but some carbohydrates quickly turn to blood sugar. And when blood sugar is raised, that promotes inflammation. So in general, products made with sugar and with flour especially uh, are of that quick digesting sort, whereas whole grains, cracked grains, uh, you know, digest much more slowly and don't pose that problem. So these are fairly simple things to learn. But again, it's the, it's the refined, processed, and manufactured foods which are the main problem. And you should really work to try to reduce consumption of them and preferably eliminate them. I'll do the 478 breath at the very end when we're done, right before questions. One thing I want to touch on too, because I see a lot of it in my practice, is a lot of misinformation going on around whole grains and vegetables, especially with lectins and oxalates. And I think that that's important to touch on because um, you know, what I see in my clients is people far under eating fiber. And I think fiber is hugely important for an anti-inflammatory diet, a healthy gut, um, sustained energy, weight loss, pretty much every approach. It's important to be getting enough fiber. And the vast majority of people are not getting enough fiber. And one of the problems that I see with people being so afraid of lectins and oxalates is all of a sudden they're not eating enough healthy whole grains and vegetables. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think we should definitely touch on lectins and oxalates. And one of the things, I don't know, maybe dad, you take, you take on the lectins and oxalates. Well, these are, are natural compounds found in uh, plants that interfere with digestion. They're sometimes called anti-nutrients. For most people, they're not a problem. You know, they're, they are, um, oxalates are particularly high in things like raw spinach and chard, and they're better cooked anyway. Um, but lectins are just not something you need to worry about. And there's, a, there's an argument out there that I, you've told me a lot about, Diane. I've seen people say that vegetables are toxic. You know, this is especially coming from the, the carnivores. You know, there's an uh, all carnivore diet being touted by some people to eat a lot of meat and to not eat vegetables. There are other diets where people avoid things like beans, which are very good foods. Beans are cheap. They're full of fiber. They are, it give you a good amount of protein and slow digesting carbohydrate. They have vitamins and minerals. You just learn how to cook them properly, but those are very good foods. Same with grains. Grains are not bad. It's what we do to them that makes them difficult when we pulverize them and turn them into quick digesting carbohydrate. I also want to emphasize too, you know, what you mentioned about how beans are cheap food is that I think a lot of times there's this idea that in order to be healthy, you need to, you know, only buy organic or that you have to have a certain income in order to eat this way. And that is just not the case. You know, if you can buy organic fruits and vegetables, that's great, but you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to buy organic in order to begin eating this way. One thing that I recommend is buying frozen fruits and vegetables. A lot of times they have a higher nutrient profile because they're picked when they're ripe rather than ripening in the store. And oftentimes that can be a cheaper, you know, more affordable way to be buying in season fruits and vegetables. So again, you know, this approach does not need to be only reserved for wealthy people. This is something that I think everyone has the means to begin doing. And one of, one of the best ways is by eating lots of legumes and beans and just, you know, making sure that you're cooking those. No one wants to eat a raw bean anyways. <laughs> right, not good. More raw, gra <laughs> more raw grains. <laughs> right, no raw grains, no raw, no raw beans. Um, one thing that I've been seeing a lot, and I'm curious to hear what you think, Dad, is you know a lot about milks and what milks are the healthiest. And I have my own opinions about this, but I'd be curious to hear what you say about you know how the milk fits in, in the anti-inflammatory diet. Well, that's you know I never liked milk when I was growing up, and I was forced to drink it. Um, I had 
bronchitis when I was very young, and I'm sure that was caused by uh, the milk that I was drinking that my body really didn't want. Um, when I'm talking about milk here, I'm talking mostly about cow's milk, and I think that has some uh, problems for many people. The dairy industry in this country uh, got itself in the position of influencing government policy and, and putting out slogans in designed and informational uh, materials designed to make kids lifelong consumers of milk. You know, things like you never outgrow your need for milk. Well, it's odd because every other animal does rapidly. Or that milk is nature's most perfect food. Yes, for baby cows, but I don't know that that's true for humans. Or that milk builds strong bones. In fact, the research shows that the countries with the highest dairy intake have the highest rate of hip fractures. Uh, and the also, that's true for the countries with the highest calcium intake, and that runs completely against what you know, most people believe. So uh, I think there are reasons to try to, but now also I think when milk is turned into cheese or yogurt, it's different. I eat high quality cheese in my diet. I like good yogurt, um, and I think those products are fine, but I think milk itself uh, may be a problem for many people. If you decide <clears throat> to avoid milk, and especially if you have growing kids, you want to make sure that you replace the protein in milk. And a number of the alternative milks that are out there, things like oat milk and almond milk, uh, these are not protein sources, so you have to make it up in another way. The only one that is is soy milk, which is comparable to the protein content of dairy milk. I think that's a reasonable substitute. Uh, in my own cooking, I personally like cashew milk. And I make it myself by just grinding raw cashews and blending them with water. And it's great for making cream soups or frozen desserts. And most people can't even tell the difference, you know, that they're not, it's not dairy. It's wonderful. And that's got very healthy fat, uh, good fiber. And it's a good substitute. And one of the things that I love about making your own cashew milk is, as I'm sure a lot of people watching know, when you go to the grocery store, if you buy a non-milk alternative, there's lots of gums, carrageenan. Um, lots of extra ingredients that are added to things like oat milk, almond milk, soy milk. Um, so one, there are really great brands that, you know, do have limited ingredients. So definitely look for those. But I think one of the benefits to making your own cashew milk is that it's just cashew and water. You're not getting, you know, lots of additives, which I think can be inflammatory for a lot of people as well. So, you know, that is a... You want to learn to be a good label detective. My daughter has been a good label detective for some time. You know, read labels of things that you buy in stores. And if there are too many items in, in, in it, don't buy it. If there are too many items that you don't recognize, don't know what they are, don't buy it. If there are things there that you wouldn't put in if you made this at home, don't buy it. You know, those are very simple rules. So what do you think, should we touch briefly on soy? Because I think there's probably a lot of questions about soy because soy is another food that gets really vilified. Yeah, a lot of people are afraid of soy. It's a relatively new food in North America, um, and many people are unfamiliar with it. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Japan. Japanese eat soy at every meal from infancy to old age. They don't eat huge quantities of it, but they eat some in every meal, whether that's tofu, miso, uh, soy sauce. And Japanese health generally is better than that of North American health. And in particular, they have lower rates of hormonally driven cancers. Uh, I think soy is highly protective. And I think eaten in, in moderation regularly, especially whole soy foods, not what we call fractionated soy foods. If you buy uh, veggie hot dogs, the, the first ingredient is soy isolate or isolated soy protein. That's not a whole soy food. But things like edamame and, uh, and good soy milk and tofu and tempeh, these are whole soy foods. And I think they are very healthy uh, part of the diet and good replacements for animal protein. Which also makes me think too, you know, one part, and I know that this is something you're really good about, is adding in fermented foods, which is really incredible for our gut microbiome. And one of my favorite fermented foods is tempeh, but it has to be done correctly because incorrectly done tempeh is not good. <laughs> um, but, you know, some of my favorite fermented foods are tempeh, which is a form of soy, you know, I like good, high quality, plain, whole fat Greek yogurt. Um, I always do plain, you know, I, I, if you like to add a little bit of sweetener, I recommend sweetening it on your own. Um, 
sauerkraut, kimchi, those are really wonderful fermented foods. And I think adding in as much fermented foods in your diet is also a really important part of the anti-inflammatory diet. I make my own pickles and my own sauerkraut and my own kimchi. And I think fermented foods are really great. They're inexpensive. It's fun to make them at home. It's fairly easy to learn how to do that. Uh, all of the microbiome researchers that I know strongly advocate eating fermented foods. Um, and I, this is something you want to do. It's for the health of your microbiome, which influences health in general, including mental and emotional health. And one, one tip is that if you go to the grocery store and you find pickles that are in um, the aisles, not in the refrigerated section, it's not a true pickle. They've been, you know, with, it's been made using hot vinegar. So you're not getting the really beneficial parts of a fermented food. So look for pickles that are in the refrigerated section. Have organisms there. So you want the kind that fizzes when you open the, open the jar. All right. Well, should we, what do you think 478 breath? Well, I'll say a word about the 478 breath. First of all, you know, I teach this to everyone I meet. I think it is one of the simplest and most effective things you can do for your well-being. If you Google my name and 478 breath, there are many videos of me teaching this that will give you all the details you need, but it's very simple. It takes very little time, no equipment, no excuse for not wanting to do it. It is a practice though. It's something you have to do regularly to get the benefits of it. But the basic technique is simply to breathe quietly through your nose to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, and blow air out forcibly through your mouth to a count of eight, and repeat that for four breath cycles. And you've got to do that at least twice a day, religiously. You can do it more frequently if you want, but no more than four breath cycles at one time, at least for the first month. So you get comfortable with it, then you can increase somewhat. And you'll, you've got to do this, as I said, regularly, and you'll begin to notice the changes after, I would say, four, four weeks, six weeks. This lowers heart rate, lowers blood pressure, improves digestion, improves circulation. The most effective anti-anxiety measure that I know helps you fall asleep, has everything to recommend it, uh, and is not even on the radar of mainstream medicine. And this is an example of what integrative medicine can do. It can bring into the mainstream uh, techniques that are inexpensive, not dependent on expensive technology, that produce very good results. And this is why I say I think integrative medicine is the way of the future. Uh, we're going to combine the best elements of standard medicine you know, with other approaches, uh, including nutritional approaches that have been so neglected in uh, conventional medicine. And before you, before I just want to say that, you know, with my clients, I work, I'm a, I'm a nutritionist, I work with people on their food. But I find that working on breath and meditation is so important for giving people the tools to then make healthy decisions. You know, stress is one of the biggest pieces that I see when it comes to making certain food choices or, you know, emotional distress and doing the 478 breath is one of the best ways to then be able to make food decisions that are going to benefit you and your health later on. So don't discount if you are someone who is trying to make better food choices, don't discount the power of doing the 478 breath and its impacts on then being able to make healthier food choices. Shall we take some questions? Absolutely. Thank y'all both for that. So much great information and the chat has been super busy. So we have some really, really good questions and I'm so glad you did the breath because I even have it on my little sticky note here on my big screen in my office of one of the things, stand, stretch, four, seven, eight, and uh, make, I get sure I get some steps Great. in it. I don't get so zoned into my computer. So I absolutely love that you did that. And I actually shared a link in the chat already to your website Great. that has that all there. So be sure to do it. And you can Google, I know the first time when um, our CEO, Dr. Stout was talking about it, I, I Googled it and searched for a video and I actually did it with you. So you can even search for uh, Dr. Wild wow video of that and do it with Good. him at the same time, which was a lot of fun. So yes, very much. All right. Um, one of the questions is, what would be your recommendation for someone that has an anti-inflammatory autoimmune disease like lupus? Um, would they need to be even more diligent with an anti-inflammatory way of eating? Yes, the mo more they can adhere to that, the better. And sometimes, you know, people with autoimmune diseases, if they follow this way of eating, are really able to reduce their dependence on medication and see fairly rapid improvement. So it has everything to recommend it for autoimmune conditions. 
Excellent. Thank you for that. All right. Oh my goodness. There's so many. Okay. Let's look at the oldest question first. We'll get y'all in. Um, I have MS. Does inflammation impact people with MS? It does. Actually, it impacts most people with chronic diseases. So an anti-inflammatory diet, again, can be very helpful there. Um, I would say also with MS, I sometimes see improvement when people eliminate uh, cow's milk in all of its forms and also look at other foods that may trigger problems such as wheat, uh, sugar, you need to experiment. And the best way to experiment is to leave something out and then add it back and see if you can establish a correlation with symptoms. Excellent. Um, I know there's quite a number of questions on kind of the dairy, the milk, that aspect. And I think y'all kind of um, answered it after there's a lot of questions in there. Um, but I just want to kind of touch on that because I know there are so many of them as far as like, really it's 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 like dr i was saying about diana saying you know she's really become a, a label detective and it really is picking things that have minimal amount of ingredients there but some people are asking oh do you have certain alternatives of cheeses that you would recommend um and i think you kind of really touched on milks as far as the least ingredients and without as added much as added other stuff we'll say <laughs> um put in it but i don't know if you had any other I'll additional thoughts on that i'll see what diana has to say with regard to cheese, I, I think natural cheeses are very good, you know, and they are also living cultures with organisms in them. I particularly like uh, cheeses from Italy, Switzerland, France that come from alpine areas. You know, these are uh, very good. They have good uh, natural organisms in them. They come from milk of cows that have grazed in high meadows with very good stuff in them. Uh, I can't imagine life without Parmesan, for example. Most of the cheeses that, you know, typical mainstream American cheeses are dead. They're processed cheeses. They don't have any living cultures in them, and they're not as healthy. Diana, do you want to add? I want to talk about fat. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there's a misconception, and it comes back to the 80s and the 90s, that fat makes us fat, which is just not true. So the reason that I always choose whole fat dairy is that, you know, fat is really important for feeling satisfied, feeling satiated. And there, you know, there are studies that show that eating a low fat diet actually promotes us to eat more because we're not feeling that satisfaction, that satiation from our diet. The other thing too, is that there are fat soluble vitamins. And if we don't have an appropriate amount of fat in our meals and our diet, we're not going to be able to absorb those nutrients, those fat soluble nutrients from things like yogurt and cheese. So we, fat is not bad. Fat helps us feel satisfied satiated and it's important for regulating our hormones and the other thing is that the way they spin dairy to make it low fat introduces um, chemicals sometimes powdered milk which is can be inflammatory so i always recommend whole fat dairy and it tastes better and food should be I, enjoyable <laughs> and also there's re, re, relatively recent research showing that kids that are raised on skim milk or low fat milk have hormonal problems that infertility in girls and acne in teenage boys. Uh, there's also a studies from Finland showing that uh, non-fat milk seems to be a trigger of type 1 diabetes in kids who are genetically susceptible. So, you know, we thought we were doing a good thing in reducing the fat in milk, and we probably weren't. And my taste tells me that whole fat dairy products are better. So, you know, I'm not worried about fat in uh, yogurt or, or, or cheese. Sure. Well, I had to say your um, story about not liking milk and having bronchitis a lot as a child, uh, that pretty much was my story as well. I did not like milk and I had bronchitis all the time, but I was a big cheese eater, <laughs> a lot of dairy as far as other things. And it has been amazing just really lessening that amount and how it, it made a big difference. So um, it's good to hear others that have been on that same journey too. All right. Um, let's see. Do you have a recipe for your cashew milk? Yeah, a very that was simple question. one. You buy raw cashews uh, and put them in a blender okay. and grind them to a fine powder, which is very fast. And then you add water and blend it at high speed. That's it. So the ratio of nuts to water determines how lean or rich the milk is. I usually start with uh, one part cashews to two parts water. And that's generally good for using it as a substitute for rich milk. Um, but you can do it, adjust it to your taste. You, it'll keep in the refrigerator for at least a week, shake it before use, 
and it's very versatile and uh, very tasty. Excellent. Very good. All right. Let's see. So many questions. Thank you all for submitting these. Um, let's see. This will be great for fiber, but how about protein? I'm currently seeking about 100 grams of protein daily and need a fair amount of yogurt and meat to get there. I know you touched a little bit on there, but is there any kind of go-to tip you would give them for that one? Uh, yes. <laughs> so I, one, I think that we have an obsession with protein in our society. So I would check in to make sure that 100 grams of protein is actually what you need versus someone, you know, a fitness influencer on Instagram is telling you what you need. Um, so check in, make sure that that's an appropriate amount of protein first. The other thing too is that, you know, fish is a wonderful source of protein. So swapping out some meat for salmon, um, you know, tuna, those kinds of things I think can be really helpful. Whole grains have protein. Quinoa is a, is a great source of protein. And then there's protein, you know, I'm not going to say that broccoli is the same thing as eating the meat, but there is protein in ev pretty much every food that we are eating. And as long as you are getting all of the amino acids sort of throughout that meal, throughout your day, you're going to be fine on protein. So I see a lot of times that people are kind of, you know, have an obsession with protein. And I like to ask the question more of how much fiber are you getting? <laughs> so, you know, just a little, just a little uh, brain swap. But I do think that fish is a really great source. Whole grains can be a great source. Who has ever asked you how much fat are you getting? Or where are you getting your fat? Where are you getting your carbs? You know, we are obsessed with protein. And frankly, I, I think a greater problem is people who consume excesses of protein. And if you eat too much protein, it's hard on your liver, it's hard on your kidneys. Uh, and I think most people don't need the amounts of protein that they're concerned with. I also don't recommend taking protein supplements and uh, protein drinks. I think we could get plenty from our diet. Yep, agree. And they're packaged with all the other great things we need. All right. All right. The next one. I have frequent bouts of colitis and increasing fiber, especially salads, grains, and beans can cause flare ups or make them worse, but I know I need to eat them. How do I get to eating this type of diet without all the gut issues? Well, first of all, you know, it, it's raw stuff that is more of a problem than cooked. So, you know, with vegetables, maybe you want to minimize consumption of raw vegetables and eat more cooked. The other is the amounts are crucial. So, you know, find a level of consumption that doesn't bother you. And then there are all sorts of ways of managing colitis <clears throat> from using traditional Chinese medicine, <clears throat> to taking supplements like L-glutamine. Uh, you know, if you go to my website and look up colitis, you'll find a lot of suggestions there for what you can do. I think that tending to your microbiome is also very important. So fermented foods. And uh, Diana, do you want to add anything to that? I just think that, you know, a lot of times with fiber, I see that people jump from, you know, maybe eating five grams of fiber a day to eating 30 grams of fiber a day. And I think that there is a slow process where you work up, pause in that fiber zone, see how you feel, your, let your body adjust, make sure you're not, you know, creating a fair flare, but then you can slowly increase. So I think the power of just very slowly upping how much fiber you're eating is really important as well. Y'all speak our language so well. Yes, uh, slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> okay, good question here. What would be, and maybe even from both of you, what would be one of your best resources or books to read about an anti-inflammatory diet if they wanted to dig into it well, more? Well, go to my website first and read about the anti-inflammatory diet there and look at the anti-inflammatory diet pyramid. Uh, take a look at my cookbook, Fast Food, Good Food. Um, and I also have a book called um, Eating, Eating Well for Optimum Health that's helpful. Diana, do you have any other resources? I mean, your website is like, I still look at his website. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I think his website is good. <laughs> so it's a wealth of information for sure. Very good. Well, I know uh, Dr. Stout, our CEO, has uh, shared several books of yours. So um, there's so much great information on his website um, and 15 different ones you've yep. published, right? So be a number of those to pick from. All right. I added both of your website links to in the chat so everyone can find you all there as well. Um, all right. We have time for a couple more questions. 
Um, I know we talked about sugar a little bit within it, but do you have any good kind of alternatives that you would recommend? I know some people kind of do the yeah. artificial alternatives, whichever word you want to use. Do you have special ones that I know y'all have mentioned a couple during the workshop, but just to kind of group them all together. They're ones that um, you would well, recommend. First of all, we should be talking about non-nutritive sweeteners rather than artificial because in that category, there are natural non-nutritive sweeteners like stevia. And then the, the artificial ones like aspartame. Artificial ones you want to avoid completely. They're all suspect for one reason or another. With the natural non-nutritive sweeteners, I think there's also a problem. And it's one that hasn't been well recognized. And that is if the brain gets a message that sweet calories are coming and then they don't, I think this sets up patterns in the brain that create future cravings that get you into worse relationships with food. So in general, I think you're much better off eating real sweeteners than anything that's non-nutritive. And of the real sweeteners, what really determines their influence of, on health is how much fructose they have in them. You know, fructose, which is often called fruit sugar, sounds very innocent, but the body can't metabolize it. And it deranges liver metabolism, it predisposes to fat storage, to disruption of insulin, and uh, different sweet sweeteners have different amounts of fructose in them. Table sugar is half fructose. Uh, agave sweetener, which people used to think was a very healthy thing, is about 80% fructose. The lowest uh, sweetener in fructose is maple syrup, about 35%. And that's my go-to sweetener. I love the taste of maple syrup. So I use that frequently. So I'm not afraid of sugar. I think we want to cut down consumption of it. And a good place to start is avoiding sweetened drinks. You know, we're in such a nutritional mess in this country. It's hard to know where even to start. If I was going to start somewhere, I would try to get people not to drink sweet liquids, whether that's not just soda, it's also fruit juice, energy drinks, putting sugar in coffee and tea, it's all of it. If, you could just, if we could just stop that, we would be one big step ahead. I also want to add in too that one thing I find is that is is people really pushing off sugar cravings or finding alternatives for sugar cravings, which I think then leads them to binging an entire tub of ice cream in the middle of the night and you know that's in the freezer. So one thing I find is that being really intentional with the way that you are enjoying sugar is important. You know, sit down, enjoy it, do it mindfully rather than you know scrambling out of the kitchen cabinet to you know be sneaky with your treats. I think really enjoy a treat know that it's okay and one thing that i find too is that having it with a meal can kind of prevent those sugar spikes and i think that that's an important conversation as well as how you are eating your sugar can be just as important as um you know what what the content is yeah very good well i'm gonna do one last really weighted question <laughs> um First of all, though, I know many people have asked if there's going to be a recording of this. Yes, it will be in your Full Plate Living account, fullplateliving.org. You can go to your library under our support. There's a whole section of workshops that we have done on a variety of different topics. And um, Dr. Weil and Diana Weil, you also will be at the top for everyone, and we'll be sharing that um, as well in our member emails and things like that. Um, but the last question I have for y'all is what are your top four recommendation recommended resources for people who want to learn more but i'll add a little bit more to that and maybe maybe the resources can be part of it but what are like if someone's new to this what are kind of your top four things you would say to them read this do this do that read that well, I, said, I would so say your website to avoid refined them. processed and manufactured food food made by other people that's my top recommendation diana I think that there, I really focus on relationship with food because I find that that leads us down a lot of, leads us down a bad rabbit hole. So one, one of my top recommendations is really getting in tune with how hungry and how full you are before and after your meals, um, I think can go a long ways in becoming more aware and in tune with your body. I, I, you asked for four though, so that's just one. <laughs> <laughs> they asked for food, but I am just, we're speaking, so you get to choose if you want. Do you have one more, Dad? You do one more, and I'll do one more. Way food. And when I'm Perfect. when I'm in Europe, especially in countries like France and Italy, people are not obsessed with how food can hurt you. You know, they don't look at the table as a minefield. They enjoy what they're eating and take time to enjoy it. 
I'm going to piggyback off that and say, don't overcomplicate this. You know, nutrition on the surface is very simple. And then as we get into the biochemistry and all this, it gets very complicated. But then at the root, it's very simple. Eat whole grains, eat real foods, eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, there's like, I love what you said, that this doesn't have to be, I think, set aside the fear mongering and kind of get to what makes you feel good. Because I think one of the things about integrative medicine is that you have your you have the answers your body is capable of healing itself and i think we all we are all our own experts and i think really getting in tune with that is important excellent well thank you both so much everyone please be sure to um, look both of them up on their websites well.com um check them out dr well i love your puppies oh, okay you don't have <laughs> We're used to all of this by now, right? Everyone works from uh, from home in different aspects. So a lot of people even comment, oh, I love your dog. So <laughs> thank you both for joining us. Um, if you did not get your question answered, please join us in our private Facebook community. Um, we will be happy to jump in and answer anything there as well. Thank you both again for being with us today. I hope you have Enjoyed a very it. wonderful day. Yeah, Take thank care. you so much. Bye. Bye.